Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual roundtable for senior housing professionals. My name is Holly Stapleton, and I'm the Chief of Staff at the Akuai Home Office, and I'll be serving as your technical director for this program. Your membership dollars fund today's program and all the efforts in this space. We sincerely thank you for your support and for being here with us today. I'd also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all of the heavy work that you are all currently engaged in and have been engaged in for all these many months. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Today, we're joined by SHO panelists who bring a variety of perspectives to this conversation. But before I pass the program to our moderator, a few quick housekeeping points. These roundtables are designed in conversation format. We see this as an opportunity for all of you to engage, connect, and really be an active part of the program. So please be ready and willing to offer your questions and insights along the way. Throughout the program, you can submit questions using your Q&A button which you can find on your Zoom menu. Please feel free to submit those as we go. You can also enter questions and comments um, in the chat function for other participants. If you see a question in the Q&A function that you also like and want to be addressed during the program, please be sure to upvote that. Another function that you have available is your raised hand function, which hopefully all of you are familiar with. If you can see us and hear us okay, I'm gonna ask you please raise your hand so we know that everything is working. Great. All right, so let's jump into the program. I'm now going to pass the virtual mic to today's moderator, Chris Silva. Chris. Holly, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and before I, I begin, I just want to say a, a, a big, big, huge uh, thank you to, to Holly, um, Spencer, and their colleagues in the Hawaii um, main office for um, always supporting us, supporting the profession. Um, and ensuring that we can um, um, conduct events uh, such as this, this roundtable. So thank you so much. Um, as Holly said, my name is Christopher Silva and I'm the Director of Housing at American University. Um, I also serve as the Chair of the Future, housing, uh, Future of Housing Work Group uh, for Hawaii. Well, fall term, fall semester quarter um, is here and um, for those that are returning to, to campus, for those with campuses uh, preparing to, um, to receive campuses, uh, very likely your professional and your student staff have already been on, on campus for several weeks. Um, you've had training, you've had um, activities um, remote, online, uh, perhaps some even in, in person with physical distancing. Um, and several of you perhaps even completed uh, move-in processes, and some may be completing them right now as we speak uh, this afternoon. Um, now, at, at the same time, um, as you've, you probably have been following from in social media and the news and also from speaking with other colleagues, um, other campuses have, um, in the last few weeks and in the last few days, uh, pivoted their operations to an online format. Um, and perhaps there are some that are a little bit in between. Uh, they may be beginning a school year virtually, online classes, but with a plan to bring students back um, in a month or so. Um, and, and some may even have been beginning with a small cohort and looking to expand. And so there's, um, we may all fall in into um, uh, different formats. Um, we're also experiencing and, and having conversations about um, um, possible financial impact um, and um, associated impacts of revenue losses, of reduction of, of occupancy, um, or even if you've pivoted online, uh, perhaps a full, um, full loss of, of, of all revenue. So um, every single day, as I was saying, we, we keep hearing of new stories, we keep hearing of, of social media posts, from professional staff, from student staff, family members about health and safety concerns and their experience that they've had um, during move-in um, or perhaps already um, a few weeks into their, their living experience. Um, it is um, difficult to predict exactly what the next few weeks and the next few months will bring, um, but we can certainly say that it's going to um, um, continue to um, um, provide us with a, a great deal of, of activity and engagement and um, um, 
and a lot of a lot of work for our our teams and our staff. Um, so today, in our in our conversation here in in this um, SHO roundtable, we have uh, three panelists that represent institutions um, of various types and also that fall into different um, situations. Uh, some are preparing to receive students, some have had to, um, to pivot to, um, to an online learning um, and still have some students, um, and some have, uh, as, as myself, that uh, have um, uh, no students living on campus this fall. Um, and um, so to provide our conversation and to, to, um, to share uh, their perspectives, we've brought these colleagues to that um, will share um, different concerns, different perspectives, different insight as they prepare um, to start fall semester. And so um, I'll be um, inviting our panelists to um, introduce themselves and share brief remarks on where they stand uh, in terms of the fall reopening status. And then after that, we'll move on to um, our discussion and, and the question and answer session. So um, as Holly said, please continue to um, um, ask questions in the, in the chat um, and we'll, um, we'll make sure to engage that in the, in the conversation. And so um, I'll ask my colleague, Dr. Victor Bell Robinson from Miami University to, um, to start um, um, the panel. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Vicka Bell Robinson and I always like to introduce myself as having the pleasure, the pleasure and privilege of certainly being as the Director of Residence Life at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Um, I use pronouns she, her, hers um, and I, uh, just sort of Miami's story is that we were originally scheduled to have our first day of classes be August 24th. Um, the halfway through the summer the decision was made to actually move our first day of classes back a week to start August 17th. Um, and, and of course, that subsequently moved everything else back, RE training, move in, all of that stuff. Um, on July 27th, the decision was announced that we would be um, foregoing the first five weeks of face-to-face -face interaction in the residential experience. And so what that meant was that our first year um, students, our, our residential students would be online, they would have online education um, from August 17th till about um, September 21st, making move-in a happening the week of September 14th. So um, this happened to be four days before our resident assistants were set to return. So as you can imagine, um, that created a moment for our office and particularly for our students that were, you know, in the midst of moving back to campus. Um, students were given an opportunity, all of, our, all of our students were given an opportunity to choose to go remote for the semester, um, which had financial implications in terms of what sort of refund they were getting back, um, to choose to take their classes um, online but still pay for on-campus services, so that's things like the rec center, the library, um, things like that or um, to be in person. And, and uh, so that's sort of what the options that students were given. They have actually until August 21st to tell the university of their option. Um, and then we've given RAs a similar sort of option in terms of um, coming back as an RA sort of as planned, um, deferring their RA appointment until next semester and then deferring their RA appointment until um, the following year or resigning. And so that they have that deadline. Um, August 22nd, because we wanted to make sure they were able to sort of free and clear make their academic decisions um, and then um, consider the RA position sort of second to that. So um, that's where we're at right now. We, of course, have students who, for one reason or another, do need to return to our housing. We have right now about 200 students um, that, for one reason or another, need to be on campus. Some of those examples include um, we have nursing students, second and third year nursing students who have a required state mandated mandated lab course that they have to take um, in order to stay on track. So we have a few of those students. We have international students um, on our campus. We have undergraduate students enrolled in graduate courses because at Miami the graduate courses are still allowed to be face to face in these early weeks, and so we have some undergraduate students in that, and as well as. Um, other folks that for a variety of reasons, um, Oxford is where they need to be. Another thing as I, I prepared a transition to let you know is that we do typically have a two year residency requirement and we are releasing, we have released second year students from their residency requirement. So we normally are a campus of about 8,300 um, beds. We're right now, yesterday's numbers, we're, we're sitting at about 5,500 beds for fall. So we're still pretty full. Um, certainly 4,000 is 
the number that, I mean, no number under 8,000 is a good number, um, but we're, we're not quite to the halfway mark yet. And of course that's for fall. Um, we expect that our numbers will go up in the spring should um, we be able to, to reopen. But students were released from their second year residency requirement all year, if that was a choice that they, they wanted to make. So um, that's a little bit about what's happening at Miami and I'll turn it over to Stephanie Lynch. Great, thank you, Vika. Uh, as Vika mentioned, my name is Stephanie Lynch and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I have the privilege of working at Georgetown University. And while I'll talk today about what we're doing, I also want to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of the hundreds of people across the campus that have come together to be able to make uh, tomorrow happen. So we are actually welcoming our first students back to campus. And I'll get to that in just a quick, in a quick second. Um, but really it has been a labor and a labor of love and I've never worked harder for 500 students in my entire life to bring them back to campus. So back in July, we had sent out a notification to students that we would be bringing about 2,000 students back to campus. We normally house about 5,400 students, all undergraduate students uh, in Washington, DC. And as we went along, we were gonna originally bring back all of our first year students and we also stood up a housing stability application for returning students, mostly high need, uh, mostly international students, or for a variety of reasons, food insecurities, housing um, instability, or financial reasons. And at the same time that I would also add is that we made a decision to not bring transfer students back at that time. But similar to Vika, we did say that we were gonna bring some students back for clinical reasons. Originally, ROTC was on the list. And so there were a number of students that we were still bringing back, including about um, 70 of our RAs. Similar to Vika, we also talked about having students being able to defer their employment for a period of time or if they chose to come back and be, and be with us for the fall semester. And then all of those things changed at the end of July. So I think there were some questions and concerns and one of the big pivot points for us was that DC is now mandating a 14 day quarantine for anybody who is coming back from an international location or from 29 hotspots throughout the United States. And so in that period of time, we decided that we were not going to bring any first year students back except for those that maybe fell into the housing instability that we had talked that I had mentioned earlier or financial situations. Um, and we also had to pivot on not bringing back our ROTC students. And at the same time, we were also told that we would not be able to bring back most of the RAs, including the ones that said they might be interested in returning. And so the decision was made by the residential education team to actually not bring any RAs back for the fall semester. And our community directors are serving as, in some ways, their RAs and their little uh, CD pods. So they have about 50 students each and excited to welcome them to campus. We have about 67 students that are currently living on campus who have been with us since we closed in March and went all virtual. And we've had some students that have transitioned throughout the spring and summer, but we've had a core group of about 67 students. And starting tomorrow, we're going to bring back our first year international students, few students that need to be here because they're helping with new student orientation. And the bulk of our returning students will be coming back on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. The bulk of our students will be coming back at that time. It's about 300 students. And then on Labor Day weekend, we're going to be bringing back our first year students. Since we pivoted so late for the first year students, and we'll get into the details, but the way that we have our mandatory testing happening as part of our reopening plan, we have students have to get three tests, one before they come to campus that we are mailing to them. The second one when they come back to campus and through our move-in process and then throughout either their quarantine or if they're not coming from a, a hot spot, they also have to be cleared before they can um, resume activities on campus. So we're planning right now for every student to have some period of quarantine up to 14 days. And we know that about half of our students will be in a 14 day quarantine period. Um, I would also add that, you know, and we can get into some of these details. Some of our big pieces have been around how we're handling meals. We put all the storage things back in their rooms if they were coming back to campus. So that has happened this week. 
and we have staff on campus today that are posting flyers and getting ready to welcome our students and have them go through the move-in process. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Christina to talk a little bit about the University of South Maine. Wonderful, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so my name is Christina Lowry. I'm the Director of Residential Life and Housing at the University of Southern Maine. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and where we're at right now is that we open next week. Um, we just welcomed um, a couple days ago all of our student leaders back to campus. We are doing testing for all of our incoming students. Um, and so uh, a bunch of our student leaders and myself included, because um, I also tested, we're all in quarantine right now. Um, we actually are supposed to be getting our test results at four. I told them they were not allowed to call me until the webinar was over. So, um, especially if my test results don't come get back very well. So, um, we are opening at a reduced capacity, but not a greatly reduced capacity. Um, so, we typically open at 128%. Um, so, from the get-go, um, we had a um, trying to figure out how we were really going to get our numbers down. Um, and we did come up with a reduced capacity model, but we really in the end achieved that through attrition. Um, we were really clear with the policies that we had. In late July, we had all of our students fill out a recommitment form, helping them understand what campus life was gonna look like, um, what office visits were gonna look like to different offices on campus, what activities were gonna look like, uh, in addition to some of the policies that we would have on campus. And through that, um, and then additionally, the professors all had the option of what modality they wanted to go to. And so the students between those two pieces decided, um, a lot of them decided not to return. So um, we, are, we are coming back under capacity, but um, I, I would say still fairly close to normal business um, compared to some other campuses. Um, so next week we have three days of move-in. We've greatly de-densified our move-in processes and everybody will test as they come onto campus and then quarantine for three days until they get their test results. Um, I think I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I would say that's one of the things that's, that's our big thing right now is how do we meet um, the, need, the needs of 800 students on campus um, as they quarantine for three days. So, um, but uh, we don't have any housing requirements. Um, we don't have any um, first year requirements or anything like that. So the students that are all returning really are at their um, own volition. Um, and so far we've gotten a really good response from the students about um, their interest in coming back and complying with, with what we're asking of them. Great. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Vicka and Stephanie, for, for that introduction, for setting the, um, the stage for us for, for this conversation. And so, you know, you all um, have talked about uh, several different pieces of the, the number of students and some of the initial, some of the logistical pieces, but what, what are you most concerned about right now in terms of, of movement and perhaps also what's you know what what perhaps is like the most complex piece in 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 this process um that you've you've been worrying and planning the most about um and uh please any any one of you uh, i think the the hardest thing to plan for is quarantine and isolation um and you know miami even though the Miami leads the university, Miami is a public school. And so we really are impacted by what's happening at the other public schools in the state of Ohio, as well as whatever is coming down um, from, you know, from Columbus, as we say. Um, and not knowing what is going to happen from day to day makes it very difficult to lead with certainty um, at a time where I think our teams really need us to. Um, so I think that is concerning. We, and again, quarantine and isolation space. Um, Miami is not testing every student as they come. We are quarantining um, students that are from high risk. We have, I think Stephanie said 29. We have like six states and international students that we need to quarantine. Um, and so that, but that was, you know, a recent thing that we learned about. And then we have to, you know, we have to pivot. And it's, I mean, we, we benefit from our delayed full opening and our reduced capacity, it gives us a bit more flexibility than we would have anticipated otherwise having. Um, but that, that's just, you just don't know how students are going to be. Um, and then, and as we, you know, hear about whether it's Notre Dame or other schools, you know, Chapel Hill, other schools that are like, we tried it and we failed and now we're not doing it, or Michigan State's pulled the plug already. Um, that I think every time somebody sort of pivots to to either completely online or they shut it down, like that is, that is very, very concerning. Um, in part because of the staff issue, 
right? In part because rent's important and um, collecting it is important and it is sort of the lifeblood of the financial components of our organizations, but also in part because we know that there are students who can't go home. Um, and, you know, what does a reduced, what, what we've been calling here at Miami, a low occupancy experience really look and feel like um, for our students. So those are, those are things that I, that stay on my mind, um, but, and, and we've got to be ready, right? Um, we've always got to be, we've always got to be ready. Uh, Stephanie joked that, um, I don't think it was a joke, but she joked, she laughed when she said it, so that makes it a joke, um, that she's never worked so hard for 500 students. And, you know, some of us are on campuses, Miami is not this example today, but have never worked hard for zero students. Um, that in, at the end of the day, no one's coming back and you spent months and months and months trying to figure out, make it, make it work and manage it. And um, that, you know, we just can't control any of that. And that, that's, that's difficult to uh, navigate. I think one of the pieces for me and it ties into what Vicka was saying was educating all of our student staff and students on the processes and the procedures and the science and the intricacies of everything in part because there's so much information out there and it's different from place to place and um, and it, it differs every day um, an hour before this call started we our system administration met with the CDC in Maine and we now have new quarantine guidelines from the CDC today. Um, and so it, it, you know, we kind of made the joke at the beginning of our RA training, you know, we've, we've talked to you for two hours, something that we've told you within these two hours has probably changed. Um, but bringing our students back and already getting some of the questions, you know, we, we have a three day quarantine and today's day three and one of our students says, okay, I need to go do X, Y, and Z. I said, okay, but you're in quarantine. She goes, yeah, but I'm gonna be, and, and all of a sudden it, for her, she, she hadn't connected all the pieces, but knowing that this is 60 students and their student leaders, um, and I, so far the, the goodwill that we're getting is really strong. It's, it's unintentional misunderstandings of different policies, especially for us it's hard because we've been, we've been dealing with it for a while, but we're starting to understand the need for flexibility, but bringing our students staff into this and our students trying to educate them constantly on all of these intricate different pieces um, is, is, is very difficult. I would agree. I would agree with that. I would sort of add on in for us is the idea that decisions changed on an hourly or daily basis, I think has been one of the complicated pieces. I mean, at one point, just thinking about quarantine, we were, um, we had an agreement with an off campus hotel that I found out like two days ago, we no longer have an agreement, which is fine because we saved the university some money. But we also hadn't planned what we were going to do for that hotel and then we were going to be on the on-campus hotel now they're quarantining in their apartments and isolation is going to be in another apartment complex on campus so i think to the the points that you know christina and uh, vicka were raising it's more just about how do you keep people informed with the most up-to-date information and i think there are moments where we've owned the data and then other people want access to the data and then want to populate the data and then who's responsible for changing it. Um, and so data being people and individuals and what you're supposed to do to care for those individuals. It's just been a really complex piece and you're in essence creating everything from scratch. And I think everybody probably feels just what the toll has been doing. Um, and just because there was a question in the chat, just to follow up in terms of the tests that we're mailing in advance to students in advance of their arrivals. So we have really focused a lot on our testing protocols. And so every student who is coming to campus that has a US address, we are mailing a test kit home before they arrive. And so we're, we had to make sure and we actually pivoted our first year students in terms of their move in date from yesterday to Labor Day weekend because we had to have at least three weeks where we could mail the testing kits, get the testing kits back for COVID, and then have the student get their answer before they could travel here to campus. So we're actually have um, a testing protocol, and then it looks like we're getting ready to announce that we're probably going to be testing students twice a week uh, to be able to, to keep up with um, any student who tests positive quickly. And so we can quickly put students in isolation. Um, but to everyone's point, I think just trying to keep staff motivated, trying to make sure that you're telling people what they need to know. And then I've been in meetings where I'm like, I don't remember if I've told you this or not. 
or we decided this in the last meeting and they're like, well, where were you? And I'm like, I don't know. So, you know, and sometimes you might have six people in a meeting and then it's 36 people in a meeting. And so just trying to keep up with all of that um, has been one of the challenges for me. Thank you, Stephanie, and, and as well, uh, Dick and Christina. And I had, following with, the, with this piece, because you've talked about the, 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 the challenging planning and, and execution, all of you talked about the, the logistics of, and, and the changing guidance or changing policies, right? And, and how um, it's not just you, right? It's, it, we know that it, we rely on number of professional staff and dozens, if not hundreds of student staff um, and colleagues across campus. Um, and it, it just got me thinking about how are you all continuing supporting and managing staff um, morale during this time when you know the information keeps keeps frequently coming and and we're we're asking more uh, in many different ways than than in any previous semester how how have you have you all um, done that how are you doing that I, I can mention one of the things that I think has been so helpful to us this past week is that we've really made what we feel are some safety focused decisions and our administration has been really supportive of those. Um, so as we've gotten some pushback, uh, Stephanie had mentioned, you know, some um, guidelines in their area about travel. Maine has the same. Um, there's a quarantine expectation and there's six states that are exempt from that, but anybody coming outside of those six states has to either quarantine for 14 days before 14 days once they arrive at the state or they have to have a negative test result within 72 hours of arriving at the state. Um, and so we've gotten some pushback from, from some families, for example, who are coming from those states who aren't exempted um, and, and wanna be able to move in. Um, and you know that, that's one example of a policy, but you know we, some of the colleges around us aren't necessarily sticking with that executive order from the governor and we are, and we're getting a little bit of flack for it. Um, and, and so then we, we kind of felt like we needed to push up to the cabinet and say like, hey, here's, here's what we're doing um, and we're sticking to our guns. We think this is, you know, the best thing to do for lots of reasons, not only because it's the law, but we also just think it's what's going to keep our community safe. Um, and they were so supportive of that. Um, and I know it's such a strange thing, but it, it, that really was what, it was a breath of relief for my team, you know, knowing that we can make decisions that are, are safety minded in the best interest of our students and they're going to be supported. I think there's just a lot of work and it's not going to that's not going to change and it's not going to stop. And so if we can make the work feel worthy and worthwhile um, and help people feel heard, I think that's what really helps the morale. Um, Christina, I would agree with that. And I just also want to give a, a shout out in particular to the, the two directors that we have in the residential living side. So Eddie Carrion and Bill Huff, because I think they've really done a lot of work to try and be mindful of, of staff as they are going through their you know, personal and family pieces in terms of not being able to be present for all the good things like fun times and births and also deaths within people's families. And also at the same time, you know, the social injustices that are happening and the conversations that we're having as an institution and as a nation. And also, I think they, they also real recognize we're in the middle of a pandemic and we also need to be um, thoughtful around making sure that we have, to Christina's point, purposeful work that is meaningful. And I think folks are excited about the community directors in particular, about connecting with the students in ways that are, that are different and harken back to the, some of the reasons why we got into this work in the first place. And I think at the same time, acknowledge that there are some real challenges that we're facing. One is the potential for us around furloughs, which we know in this financial climate we are at least privileged at this point. We have not had long discussions around layoffs, but you know, I think furloughs we, we know are sort of one of the next barriers or hurdles that, that might be coming. And I think one of the challenges we've faced of late is in, in some ways straddling the world between sort of more of the facilities ends of and auxiliary pieces were not considered in the auxiliary business world. And at the same time, the student affairs world and there are different expectations and there are different cultures right now that are, you can see in very stark relief about who needs to come to campus, when do people come to campus, 
Um, residential living has been open the entire time and most of the other offices in student affairs have been virtual since, since March. And I think that's created some, some tensions. And at the same time, some of the partners that we work with most closely are the staff that are here 24 seven. And so how do we, how do we navigate that? I think that's been the, been one of the points that has been most of a struggle that we had to try to sit there and navigate and provide some, some perspective in both hope and what the realities are. Um, I tried to, well, in, in March, and, and actually just recently I did it again, but in March we started obviously meeting as a department more and more um, frequently, and those early meetings, up until, I guess we sort of stopped meeting super regularly at the end of May, um, but every time I would start our meeting, I would talk about three things that guide my decision making, um, their health and well-being and safety, um, their employment, our sort of joint um, employment, and then affirming the importance of our unit to the institution. I think it's really important um, and it's easy to look at residence life or housing and say, oh, well, there's nobody there, so it's not important. Um, so it was really important in those early days, and it continues to be important now, that we are recognizing where is the institutional need and that we're pivoting towards meeting that institutional need. Um, because regardless of what's happening in the residence halls, they're all Miami University students and we want them to be successful. And this is a stressful time for them. We are uniquely positioned as generalists to be able to provide student support wherever those students need um, to be provided that support. And so, um, that kind of assurance that like, if you're like, well, it's Vika thinking. Well, Vika is thinking, how do I keep my staff safe and healthy? Um, how do I keep them employed? And how do I remind the university that we're an important part of the institutional experience? And so that's been, that's been my focus. I also try to insert fun when we can. Um, we, uh, we're doing this thing for RAs uh, where we're all submitting videos. And so uh, myself and a few of our colleagues did a really funny, like, we don't know how to use Zoom video. We're hoping to get a huge, laugh out of it but just to just to you know try to keep it light when we can keep it light we talk a lot of my staff too about keeping little things little it's kind of our theme for the year so like we're in a pandemic and we need to feed our A's when they're here for training one of those things is huge the other thing we can manage so let's not freak out about how am I going to have enough spaghetti because that's a little thing we're going to keep it we're going to keep it little so um, I also think that it, it is helpful for staff to understand as much of the bigger picture as possible um, and honestly I'll you know I'll say that it, it's sometimes a struggle um, we were in before the before the webinar started we were talking a little bit about SA chat I don't know what's going on in SA chat but there's been a lot of conversations about like well nobody cares about us and they don't understand and we're on the front line and I'm like all I'm trying to do is keep you employed I don't know how to demonstrate more care for you than to keep you employed. Um, and so there's, I think it can be a, it can be a little bit of a challenge. I certainly um, want them to feel cared for. I, I do care. So it's not just like, I want them to think I care about them. Like I do, I do care. Um, how I'm demonstrating that care may not align with how they want to be cared for um, because I understand sort of the bigger picture and the implications of that. So, um, but I do, you know, try to remind them and it was helpful. I think it, it was, it's actually going to be more challenging as we go into a new school year because some of the relationship development that we were able to do before March, we are missing right now. And so, um, but we, I also, I also say lastly, that being here, so today I'm in Oxford, I'm in my office, my door is periodically open if I'm not doing something. I think for our in-hall staff that have been on our campuses since March, where the campus was empty, just our mere presence, of being here has helped them like oh i'm not as alone um so i think that those are some ways that we can help the morale of our teams vika thank you thank you so much um, and continuing this in this discussion about staffing uh, just taking to 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 a place where um, i know um, i i've continued to to work on this i've had some conversations with stephanie and other colleagues in, in, from DC about, and I we see that Vaughn has asked him in the chat, but um, you know, uh, at, at American University, we have pivoted to online and um, we only, and I said, we don't have any students on campus. We actually have about 25 living in an emergency housing uh, situation in just one building, two floors. Uh, you know, we usually house 4,300 students. So, um, so uh, immediately, as soon as we went on, online, we, um, 
began to ask ourselves about what, what are we going to do? There's a massive uh, revenue loss, um, concern for, for staff. And so um, we have been thinking and have been working on, on different ways to continue to engage staff and support or the units. Um, but the questions continue is how long will this last? What, what, is, what happens in terms of, of, of staffing for, for my team? And so um, um, I know that, um, and, and sorry, this is a statement and there's a question coming. So uh, is um, we want to balance um, the university's um, um, administrative needs and, and financial stability with also supporting our staff and finding a way to, to ensure both of those, right? And so, um, and I know, and I was going to pose it to, to you, Stephanie, because I know you started talking a little bit about that. Um, if you um, had any, any insights or any uh, aspects of how, um, um, you know, conversations or, or, or suggestions about um, what this, this process of supporting staff and um, to balance the, the, the administrative and the staffing needs um, and um, perhaps creative ways that you found on, on engaging staff in this, in this shift. So. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, a couple of things that I would mention, I think I'm also both optimistic, strategic, and a little bit of a realist all rolled up into one on, on this particular topic in the sense that you know, we were in a situation back in the spring and we can continue to be in a situation where we're already reduced in terms of the number of staff that we have by a third due to vacancies that we have not been able to uh, go ahead and hire for because we are in a hiring freeze. And so hoping that because of some of those uh, constraints, also because we don't have RAs on campus for the fall and CDs, uh, in their particular roles have stepped in that we're trying to say, well, would you really get rid of somebody who is helping to provide that support for a first year student and, you know, the complex mental health needs that students are coming with and, and just having to navigate those pieces. Um, our associate director of residential education is now our point person, mostly for student affairs, but in particularly for residential living in terms of students that are moving in between quarantine and isolation and connected to the public health group. So given sort of really prominent roles in support of the, the mission, I think as Vika had talked about earlier. And then on, you know, more of the services side of pieces and where I think we blend the roles and responsibilities are, you know, we haven't made any decisions about summer 2021. So we're full on doing our summer conferences. So we will need our summer conference person. We are planning on having spring and we changed our housing assignments two or three times. So you will continue to need housing assignment people. And, um, you know, farming out different roles in terms of, you know, we had originally thought about uh, these key management groups that we have. We got rid of our residence hall offices. That's a different conversation for another day about centralized mail. Um, but made it someone else's responsibility just to show that there is, is worth to that. Buildings are older and we are going to make sure that our staff gets in and inspects every building at least every couple of weeks in every single space and open up every room um, we also have, and I'll give the university a lot of credit, we had a deferred uh, maintenance bond that we had. And so we were able, we, it looks like we are taking a building offline early to do some renovations. And we've also spent money on some other projects. And so we need people on the residential living side that can, can do that. And strategic and not strategic, but maybe it's just advantageous is residential living are the only staff that are considered essential in student affairs that have that on their job responsibilities. And I think back to what we talked about earlier, folks know that when the hurricanes happen and, and when something happens on campus and there is a crisis, they're the people who have been tested. They are the people that are the generalists to what Vika had mentioned. And they're the people that are showing up and will do the additional work that needs to be needs to be done. And so we've really tried to be as strategic as we can about when we're in spaces with senior colleagues to tell the narrative of the work that we're, 
that we're doing, what they are doing, and also trying to, and I think this has been the more complicated piece, is also help to put what the appropriate boundaries are on, given their skills and their talents. And it doesn't always have to be always residential living, which I think is what we've run into a little bit. So in some respects, um, it's trying to play, you know, sort of the both and. They can be here, they can make positive contributions, but let's use their skills and their talents and what they should be doing as opposed to always the busy work that needs to be done. And I think that's been some of the, the pushback that I've had to make in some of those conversations as well. And Stephanie, thank you. Those are uh, great examples. And um, one piece to, to share here from American where the moment when we pivoted uh, a couple of days later, um, we had lists of possible repositioning locations for our staff. And, and actually AU has a program called Continuity Partners through Human Resources where other offices are submitting needs and we're trying to match staff through that. And so that has been really beneficial for us to um, uh, connect our, our staff and also quickly find the opportunities. And so um, I can share that right now, uh, all of our um, housing staff has already been connected with other units for, um, you know, some of this is 15 to 20 hours to 25 hours a week that uh, they're already doing other work with other units. And, um, but the, the concern is still there, of course, of, of you know, are we gonna have furloughs, what other financial, um, um, you know, reductions are we going to have to implement to, you know, to meet this, this year's budget that was already reduced. But um, from, from, a, from, I would say from, from American University's perspective, which is a rather mid-sized private university, um, our um, conversation in, in terms of this has been, we'll wait until ad drop deadline to know full enrollment numbers um, so that we understand what is going to be the financial impact. Uh, but staff very likely should expect that there's going to be increased weeks of furlough and very likely reduction to retirement benefits. More than that already happened. So similar to what uh, Stephanie, you had mentioned about planning for spring or planning for next summer, how we would need staff members that they would be brought back from the units. That is still our perspective. So the, the question of a layoff hasn't, um, uh, hasn't really been um, defined. So, um, but yeah, um, I know we have um, a few more questions that we want to get to, and we of course are, are, are getting close to to our um, to our time. But um, and I wanted to, to to pivot a little bit in terms of it's still in this topic of, of innovation. But um, uh, Vika and, and Christina, um, any any um, innovative concepts, new ways that you you think your um, staff um, is going to be implementing this year um, to build community in this new physically distant um, setting, this, this physically distant residential experience. Yeah, um, a few a few things that we're working on. We've actually been inspired by a school near us that we're, um, we're really pretty close with, um, Southern Maine Community College. And they've been doing, since they ended in March, uh, some really robust electronic programming. But one of the things that they found is that, um, is they've really been advertising it to their entire student population. And they tend to have a smaller residential population anyway, typically. But in offering some of this, what they found is that they actually have students that they normally wouldn't get to connect with, that they're able to connect with. And the other thing is they're leveraging a lot of technologies really nicely. Um, and so they're using Discord, they're using Wakelet, they're just using all of these different technologies. There's, I don't remember the name of it, but there's a free game system that you can use on online. It's just browsers. You don't have to buy it, um, but they're arranging games through that. Um, and so there's just a lot that they're doing electronically, but they're finding because of that, they're able to, um, to reach actually more students than they would typically. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're really trying to utilize our outdoor space really strategically. Uh, there's a ton more um, picnic tables outside. We're talking about getting some Adirondack chairs. We're putting lots of tents up. 
Um, we, because we're in Maine right now is really, you know, in the next couple of months is really when it's most beautiful. Um, November is going to be tough for us. Um, but um, for right now, we're really trying to get outside and really utilize the outside um, really strategically. Uh, the other piece is that as far as move-in goes, um, our students are going to be spoiled when they move in because we've got so much stuff that we're going to have in their rooms. Um, and in part, it's because of that three-day quarantine, but, um, you know, tons of snacks, um, masks. We're going to have some um, contests based on masks, like show your mask off, um, things like that. And so doing a lot in those first few days, um, really partnering very heavily with orientation and student activities. Um, and, and with dining and into what we're putting into the rooms. Um, lots of condiments, sets of silverware, things like that. Um, and so leveraging those partnerships as well, uh, especially again for those first few days when uh, we, we know typically it's hard to adjust to college life, especially for a first year student in a pandemic when you have to quarantine for this first three days, um, it's, it's gonna be brutal for some people. Um, and so we're putting a lot of, of energy into that and hoping that even though they're gonna be in quarantine, we'll find lots of ways to forge those connections and then continue them on as we go through the semester. I would say in a, in a non sort of quarantine kind of environment, I think trying absolutely everything that we can think of um, to, to get engaged students. And so, um, you know, we, our students have selected to be at, at Miami, uh, our students have selected to be here. Um, they, they had a remote option and, and yet they were compelled, right, to come um, back, to, back to Oxford, back to um, living on campus, many of them. And so we want to uh, we want to honor that and not just doing everything virtually, um, but we also know that, you know, there's real safety and health concerns. And so the, the, the thinking about how do we how do we balance that? I, we have an area coordinator system I'm um, in our area coordinators we have three of them on our campus and they really work with academic initiatives in addition to running a facility and I tasked them today I'm like go through all of the living learning communities and come up with two ideas that people can do in the next couple of weeks that are virtual because right now a vast majority of our residential population is virtual and we don't want to wait until they get here to start building community and so we had hall meetings um, this past Sunday just like we normally would but we had to do it through zoom and so it's you know you talk about pivoting quickly, right? So we, we just, we actually just became a Zoom school last week. Um, and so we really did have to learn it all very quickly. And, you know, there, there's definitely feedback from our, our staff that's like, oh, we got this at last minute, and we, it's all last minute. Well, that's, we're in a last minute world. Um, and so, but that, but what we found was that students really ate that up. Um, they enjoyed the breakout rooms. They enjoyed, <laughs> today I was talking to one of the area coordinators and he was like, yeah, people got like dressed up and like comb their hair. Like they really, cause they're so thirsty for interaction. And so I think we gotta, we gotta lean into that. Um, virtually right now for Miami, while our students are away, but also for those students who are here. And once the, the majority come back in person as well, we just gotta figure it out. And I just wanna add on a little bit, cause, cause Christina, when you were starting to think, Talk, there are a couple things that I was thinking about as well about, um, you know, we we're talking about innovation, but at the same time, innovation might be also going back a little bit to our bread and butter around, to Vika's point earlier, people are craving human interaction. Like I was on, on campus today and I hadn't seen one of the people from ground since March. And it was like an, a homecoming to be able to see some of the people that you've not gotten to see before. So we're talking about like, how can you do some social distancing programs to walk down the waterfront or the National Mall? Or can we do an out outdoor exercise Yates activity because our rec center is going to be closed? You know, I, I know, you know, the professionals, we talk about like Zoom fatigue a lot. And I can't imagine for a student having to be on class all day. And then, you know, I worry about students that are, um, you know, traveling great distances, they're going to be in a 14 day quarantine that provides so much community. And I think about like, why do we see some of the behaviors that we have seen? And I think some of it is just because they haven't had interactions with physically with people for so long that I think that, you know, they're college students and they're going to experiment and they want to be both adults and get a chance to see, see people because they haven't. And we know they're coming in with significantly more mental health concerns than we've ever seen. And, and so just worried about how we can help support them and maybe provide them some stability in a place that is not stable right now. I just wanna comment real quickly on Stephanie's uh, sort of bread and butter. And 
um, I shared earlier uh, with the group as we were preparing that, I mean, we just made a big error this week. You know, we're so focused on like pivoting and making sure our staff is being used and we're used to big numbers and we have much smaller numbers and we can just kind of miss students in that. We can miss our early arrivals. We can miss those students. And so I think it is really still important that like, no, okay, you don't have 4,300 students at American, but you have 20. And so how are we like making sure that those students know that they matter? Um, you know, we lost sense this week of our care. Um, and you know, it wasn't completely on residence life. I'll take responsibility, but not all of it. Um, but at some point we became so focused on what if that we forgot about what's now. Um, and so I think it's really important to make sure that we are focused on the what's now um, and that we're, we're doing, we're, we are, for the students who are here, this is their college experience. And so how are we making it the best it can be? Um, how are we helping them know that they matter? How are we making sure they're resourced? Um, how are we doing that? How are we still committing to doing that while we are also worried about like, will my, are, we, are there going to be fur furloughs? Are, there, are these other things happening? And over the summer, we didn't really have to worry about the students who were here um they were they lingered or whatever and they knew what was up but as we welcome students back um just how we approach the welcoming of, of students back particularly if there are less of them on campus if moving is staggered we do have to really think about like what what's our bread and butter and housing and make sure that we're we're still doing that well Vicka, thank you thank you so much and that was perfect because it segues into um kind of our our our, our last piece which is you know, what, what advice do you have for, for colleagues as we were going into move in or, or post move in or, or pivoting, uh, you know, a, a situation where there's very likely chances of increased cases in, in their campus and further adjustments of operations. I mean, uh, Christina, Stephanie, what other advice do you have about uh, for colleagues to, to, to keep in mind as they go into um, to their campuses or let's say back to, back to work in their campuses? I will do, I mean, I can, I can start. I think one of the things that I've had to figure out or do more of and do differently is to give myself some grace and continually to give other people more grace than sometimes I normally would. This sounds awful, but like the way I normally would is um, that just to understand we're all under a lot of stress and we're all under a lot of pressure and we're never going to get it all right that we can plan as best as we can, we can inform people as best as we can. It, and it's just, it's a stressful time. And I think I've gotten to, at different periods of time, gotten to the point where I'm like, it's okay, you don't have to hang on as tightly to having to feel like you need to do it all perfectly because it's, it's just not going to be perfect. So try for good. And do what you can, I think, to what, you know, Vika was talking about earlier, like, what are your core values? What are your core principles? And, and work on those pieces and say, I'm sorry when you did something that you shouldn't have, or maybe that you were in error or that you forgot or apologize and give the same grace, grace to others because they're doing the same thing you are. I was going to say something very similar. Uh, we, that's one of the things that we've talked a lot about this week is trying to give everybody grace, um, ourselves, um, the parents and students that are coming in that are stressed and that's manifesting through frustration with us, um, our colleagues who we've worked with for years and we've, you know, kind of had seamless operations with and all of a sudden they're dropping things. Um, it's just a hard place to, to be right now trying to get everything done. Um, and so really trying to make sure that we're being kind to ourselves, but also just as kind to others um, because they need it as well. Um, the other thing is I, I feel like I spend a lot of my days running around trying to give people agency to do things. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's because I'm, I'm fortunate that I've been involved in all the decision making all summer um, and since March. And so I kind of understand where all my boundaries are. Um, and I think sometimes because of that, what I've noticed is that people expect that there's an answer for things that there's not. And so really the last couple of weeks I've had to say to people, we're all making it up. You know, it's, it's okay. You know, when the RAs say, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I'll say, I'll give you what we're seeing is emerging best practices, but make it up um, because none of us have done this before and we're pioneers and we're leaders and we're innovators. Um, and so if, if you think it's that I've got good answers, thank you so much. It's because I, I calmly made them up on the spot. It's not because I have a playbook. Um, and so, you know, with my colleagues, with my RAs, with my RDs constantly saying, we're all making it up. 
you guys are all smart people. You're here for a reason. You, as long as you've got the care of our students at the heart of what you're doing, then, then run with it um, because we just need to get things moving forward. Chris, I know that um, I sort of spoke in the last in the last question, but I'll just add that I, there's there's this. We have to be really careful about how afraid we are of our students. Um, and so I would say my advice is be not afraid. Be not afraid of our students. Um, wh wherever we work, you know, I don't know Georgetown students, um, but I assume they're similar enough to Miami students and that Stephanie shouldn't be more afraid of her students than, uh, but be not afraid of our students. They're not trying to make us sick. They're not trying to be irresponsible. They're students, just like they were a year ago. And they're going to make some mistakes and they're going to do some things and that's because their brains are still developing um, and they've never done this before either so so be not afraid be not afraid of our students Vika, thank you very much and, and and thank you stephanie christina as well for for sharing for your contribution to this um this this round table and um, definitely um wishing everyone uh, a great um start of, of, of the semester and that uh, everyone remains safe and, um, and that staff members are, are able to do their work in the, um, the best way possible with the, always with the um, student, uh, student's best perspective in, in mind. So thank you. Um, so um, we're reaching the, the end of our, of our time together and so I wanted to, to say a couple of things. Um, we're hoping to host another SHO um, roundtable next week. Um, so connecting with um, colleagues from, from institutions as more information, as more move-in is happening as we're learning about other schools. So um, more information to share. So please keep your, um, uh, keep your eyes open for, for information about that on your emails on the Google website. Um, also, um, Reminding everyone that we do have in the um, COVID-19 uh, Future of Housing uh, Workgroup resources, um, we have the housing tracker. So if somehow something has changed in your campus, your housing capacity has changed, you've pivoted online, um, if you can go back to this site and update, it's really good for us and also colleagues in the profession to know um, where your campus stands. Um, and then last, um, Akuhai is releasing a, a resource to assist senior housing officers um, uh, advocating uh, for the repurposing, repositioning of live-in staff um, if, if needed in your campus. So this is going to be sent um, to all the members via an email message as well as promoting social media. So please um, 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 expect that and also um, check that out if that's uh, of benefit to, to, you, um, to your staff. So. Uh, once again, thank you very much for um, for the panelists being here, and I'm going to now um, pass it uh, back to uh, Dr. Holly Stapleton, Chief of Staff um, at Kauai. Thank you, Chris, and thanks to our panelists and everyone in attendance today. Um, we hope that this was beneficial or maybe a breather for y'all as you work through everything on your campus. Um, we look forward to seeing you soon in the virtual space. Take good care. <laughs>